So thank you, Chris. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed a really thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, just uh, a couple of words about our program. Uh, after uh, uh, Gil Van Bachlen's keynote address coming up, uh, you will proceed to the ballroom section in the exhibit halls on the other side uh, to your left as you exit. There, there are four concurrent sessions that we're going to have before lunchtime. Those are a global approach to clinical trials, pros and cons. Each one of these sessions is really terrific. And if I was an individual, I wouldn't know which one to, to go to. The second is a scientific sex, uh, session, uh, mixing modalities, cells, genes, and devices. Uh, the third concurrent session is safety issues in stem cell therapies, immunogenicity, tumorigenicity, and genetic stability. And finally, uh, stem cell politics, the advocacy agenda for 2012, which is chaired by a, a former governor of Wisconsin, Jim Doyle. So you really have some terrific choices. Uh, and I, I hope those events will be well attended. Uh, after lunch, uh, during lunch, during lunch, grab your box lunch, get something from the concession stand if you didn't buy a box lunch, and definitely uh, go to the South American workshop, which is going to be in one of the ballrooms. Uh, uh, we have some tremendous speakers on that, uh, on that panel. Uh, also, we have uh, for the advocates in the audience and people who use Facebook and Twitter and whatever, empowering advocates and researchers through social media and the blogosphere. Our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Gil Van Bachlen. And uh, uh, Gil is the CEO of one of the most prominent companies in our field today, uh, Athersis, a public company. Uh, when I think of Gil, I think of him as a leader. Uh, he is the chair of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, as many of you know, the Alliance is a very strong and emerging organization of companies, nonprofit foundations, institutions uh, that are presenting an industry face for regenerative medicine and facing all the challenges that confront us, issues such as reimbursements, how are we going to move forward with cell standardization? How are we going to work with the regulators? Uh, so this is a, 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 a filling an unmet need in our world. So I'm delighted to present Dr. Gil Van Bachlen as our next speaker. Thank you, Bernie. Thanks, Bernie. Well, I always uh, enjoy listening to Chris Mason speak. I think he's, uh, he's very passionate, energetic, and committed to the field of cell therapy and regenerative medicine. Um, it's a great privilege to, to be in his company as well as uh, a number of the other speakers and participants in the conference this week. I think this is a very important event because it provides us with the ability each year to really showcase and talk about some of the amazing progress that's being made, but also highlight some of the challenges and difficulties that face us as, as a field in a discipline. It's a real privilege to be here today to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you on the uh, potential, what I see as the trans transformational impact of regenerative medicine and cell therapy. Uh, in my various roles as, uh, with Athersis as uh, chairman and CEO, as chairman of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, uh, my involvement with the, uh, the Board of Governors for the National Center for Regenerative Medicine, as well as the boards of the McGowan Institute in Regenerative Medicine. I spent a lot of my time thinking about stem cells in regenerative medicine and, and how it can achieve what many believe is its true potential. So today I'd like to share some of my thoughts with you in that regard, but also highlight some of the challenges and difficulties um, that, we, that we face. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'd like to cover four specific topic, topics. Uh, first, I'd like to spend a few minutes defining some key challenges to the healthcare system. Second, I'd like to describe how I envision regenerative medicine technology can help address some of these fundamental challenges. Uh, third, I'd like to take a look at some of the recent indicators of progress in the field. I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in Athersis, but I'm going to talk more globally about some of the very exciting progress that I see and some of the key trends and metrics that I see that really define how the progress is being made. And then finally, we'll examine some of the, the hurdles to the field. Now, as we all know, the world is currently in the midst of a dramatic and unprecedented demographic shift. 
as a result of the aging of the baby boom generation. Uh, the global population over the age of 65 is growing and expanding at an unprecedented rate. Here in the United States, for example, uh, between the years of 2010 and 2030, the number of individuals over the age of 65 will increase from 40.2 million in, two, in 2010 to more than 72 million in 2030. This represents an increase of approximately 80 percent. In fact, this year is a very important transition year because this is the year that the first of the baby boomers begin to hit that 65 milestone. A similar picture exists in Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. Now, in the next few years, the impact of this unprecedented shift on our healthcare system will be profound. We know that as we age, we spend more on health care for one very simple reason. We need to. As we get older, we're more susceptible to a range of diseases and conditions, including heart disease, stroke, progressive neurological conditions, cancer, pulmonary disease, renal disease, diabetes, arthritis, and many others. So as we enter what we like to think of as our golden years, we will spend three to seven times as much on health care per year than we do when we're young simply trying to maintain a reasonable quality of life. The macroeconomic impact of this will be profound in the years ahead. Now, as I mentioned, this year marks an important transition because the baby boom generation begins to hit retirement age this year. And this trend is going to accelerate over the next few years. So as that's happening, aging-related diseases are becoming more prevalent and more meaningful on a personal level. According to studies by the Alliance for Aging Research, a substantial majority of our healthcare resources are actually associated with chronic disease conditions. And perhaps even more scary, frequently it isn't just one condition that's affecting us. In fact, over 60% of healthcare spending is for patients that are experiencing multiple chronic conditions. Now, last fall, um, shortly after I became chairman at the, the Alliance, the team initiated a process of studying the economic impact of an aging population so that we could better understand the challenges, opportunities, and potential impact for regenerative medicine. We began by focusing on the big picture and quickly realized that simply as a consequence of aging, we will see an enormous increase in aggregate health care costs over the next 20 years. Now, as we see from this figure, um, there's two curves that are shown here. The first curve, which is in green, actually shows, broken out by, by age group, how much we spend on health care every year. The second curve, which is shown in red, actually shows that there's going to be a dramatic increase in health care expenditures as the population ages, and this cohort on this end of the spectrum increases dramatically, um, as I described a few minutes ago. I refer to this as the Mount Everest of health care. Now, the interesting thing about this analysis is this analysis actually assumes zero inflation over a 20-year time frame. So you can see that the, the amount of resources that are going to be required simply to maintain the status quo is going to grow dramatically. But I don't think anybody here believes that assuming inflation at a zero, uh, at a zero rate or a zero rate of inflation over a 20-year time frame is realistic. If you assume even modest inflation, it causes this curve to shift up and out and further expands the projected economic impact. Now, these challenges are going to also create some very compelling opportunities. Wherever there's great challenges, I think uh, great opportunities exist. And so I think that developing therapies, as Chris was talking about, that can actually have a fundamental impact in terms of improving clinical outcomes, enhancing patient quality of life, and also shifting the cost curve in the right direction, um, those technologies will be in great demand. And I believe that's exactly what the field of regenerative medicine and cell therapy can actually deliver. But perhaps just as frightening is the lack of infrastructure and physicians we're going to face. According to the AMA, by 2020, there's going to be a significant shortage of primary care physicians and specialists in the areas that we will need the most. This shortage will make it more difficult for patients to access physicians for routine or preventative care thereby making it more difficult to detect and effectively treat expensive and debilitating conditions through early detection. It could also create or exacerbate a very significant inflationary impact on health care as resources, both human and other resources, become more scarce. So where are the health care dollars actually going? Well, 
According to the, the annual report compiled by the National Center for Health Statistics, which is a part of the federal government, uh, we, according to the most recent uh, year measured, we were spending about $2.34 trillion per year on health care, which represents approximately 16 percent of GDP. Now, the United States is frequently criticized for the high proportion of health care resources that we spend uh, as a percentage of GDP. So statistically, it has not correlated with improved life expect expectancy or enhanced clinical outcomes uh, or quality of life measurements, at least the way most people look at it. However, what many people fail to consider or acknowledge is that this number reflects in part the enormous investment we make each year in medical research. Uh, the number that is actually shown here, which accounts for about 7 percent of the total health care expense, actually is a sub substantial understatement of the investment that we actually make as a nation, because it does not reflect the amount that biopharmaceutical companies, device companies, and other companies spend each year on R&D. Okay. So the aggregate numbers unquestionably show that we lead the world in our commitment to research in medicine. Uh, and I can tell you we're not the only ones that are focused on cell therapy and regenerative medicine. There are national initiatives in many other parts of the globe, people that are really focused on this as a transformational area of, of impact. But it's worth noting from these numbers that we spend about 40 percent of our health care resources on hospital care, nursing home care, and home health care, and over 60 percent when you include physician and clinical services. Now, one of the points of criticism that, uh, that I hear frequently is that it's the high cost of drugs that is causing the high cost of health care. Well, the data shows that that simply is not true. We only spend about 10 percent of our health care resources on prescription drugs. And about 70 percent of all prescription drugs are generics. So the math just doesn't add up for those people that are blaming uh, the, uh, the drug companies, if you will, for causing the problem. The problem is a much deeper and broader problem than that oversimplification. Now, as we've heard over the past couple of days, there are many areas where regenerative medicine can have a profound impact on clinical medicine, and I'm going to talk about some of these. There's exciting progress being made, as Chris and others have talked about. As we've already seen already, uh, cells as therapeutics can achieve far more than the traditional concept of simply replacing damaged, lost, or injured tissue. We see more and more examples of how uh, a range of cell therapy approaches can exert multiple therapeutic effects through what scientists or biologists like to refer to as trophic mechanisms, which is a, just a fancy way of saying that the cells are making multiple different factors to promote healing or speed tissue repair and recovery in multiple different ways. They can also regulate other cell types in the body uh, and, or, and organ systems. So these therapies can dramatically enhance the body's ability to heal and can do so in multidimensional and dynamic ways that conventional approaches, as Chris was describing, uh, simply can't achieve. And I believe that's really one of the most fundamental and exciting elements of, of what we're doing in the field of stem cells and regenerative medicine. So I believe, and I'm sure that many of you would be inclined to agree, that regenerative medicine has the power to transform healthcare as we know it. But, but candidly, um, this transformation can't happen soon enough. In fact, um, in, a, in a study that was published earlier this year by the American Heart Association, it pointed out that in 2010 we spent about a little over $272 billion a year on heart disease alone, cardiovascular disease. And this just represents direct costs. Uh, there was another $171 billion in indirect costs. But as a result of uh, the, the aging population and the increasingly obese population, these numbers are expected to soar in the years ahead. In fact, by 2030, the American Heart Association projects that direct costs associated with cardiovascular disease will more than triple from their current levels to more than $818 billion a year, again, primarily as a result of the aging population. So I, I think it's probably an understatement to say that this is a serious, serious problem that we've really got to start moving towards solving now. Now, when we break these numbers down further uh, and just look at it in terms of the actual number of individuals and patients affected, we see that cardiovascular disease is affecting a substantial number of people. And projections are that by 2030, it will affect almost 40 percent in one form or another of all Americans. That is a really, really scary number. Okay. And all these numbers that are shown here, obviously, are, are going to be going up with the aging and increasingly obese population. But unfortunately, it's not the only problem we face. 
Um, over the past few years, there's been an alarming increase in childhood obesity rates, as well as escalating rates of obesity in adults. However, the long-term impact has not been fully considered, actually, in the AHA analysis, which primarily focused on the impact of the anticipated demographic shift, so the aging of the population. However, we know that obesity is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, renal disease, a range of other conditions that have an enormous clinical, societal, and economic impact. And we see that this, this early trend or this increasing trend of diabetes is now beginning to have a very real impact uh, on diabetes among individuals age 65 and over. This has begun to increase, as you can see here, at an alarming rate in the past few years. The comorbidities associated with diabetes, including vascular disease and other conditions, suggest that this could be the leading edge of a very, very scary trend. The economic impact of this is already being felt, as described in studies by the American Diabetes Association and others, um, and these are expected to, uh, to increase substantially uh, in the years ahead. Okay. What about neurological disease? Well, there's a host of problems here. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at stroke as an example, and we, we'll also look at chronic progressive neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, you're talking about a substantial number of people that are affected each year. And of course, this isn't just happening in the U.S., it's happening worldwide. In fact, worldwide, there are about 15 million people that, 15 million people each year that suffer a stroke. Uh, in the U.S., there's about 800,000 individuals, about 85 to 90 percent of these are ischemic strokes caused by an obstruction in the brain that cuts off blood flow. The rest are hemorrhagic strokes. Um, and if you look at the, the numbers in terms of the United States, Europe, and Japan, it's about 2 million people each year. And that number is expected to grow as more and more people begin to enter that phase of life when they're susceptible to stroke or other forms of cardiovascular disease. Furthermore, there's been a dramatic rise in the frequency of ischemic strokes among young people. Um, the, and actually, before I get to that, I want to just uh, talk about some of these numbers here. You're talking about a significant percentage of people that suffer an ischemic stroke that are permanently disabled. And even after whatever the best medical care that can be provided to them, you're talking about half the patients that suffer a stroke that have substantial weakness on one side of their body and unable to really function normally. Um, a substantial percentage that, func that have chronic depression, 30% uh, that can't walk without assistance, and over a quarter of people over the age 65 that have to be institutionalized. And the average time of institutional care for these types of individuals is multiple years, okay? and it's incredibly expensive. The average cost of that is about uh, $80,000 or more per year just for the institutional care costs. It doesn't include the other costs. So we've also seen this dramatic increase in terms of the number of strokes over the past few years among young adults. So we've seen the, the incidence of stroke rise by 50% among young males aged 35 to 44 and increase by about 30% among women of the same age. So these are big problems. Okay. In terms of the, the, the cost of care and uh, the, you know, the, the overall magnitude it's staggering. I mean, we're talking about $73 billion a year in direct and indirect costs just simply for stroke care. So this, these trends that I described, the increased frequency, um, the impact that it has it is very serious and it's going to uh, continue to get worse over time. And the currently available solutions um, have simply failed to address the situation in any meaningful way. The, the current best form of therapy, a drug TPA, which was developed by Genentech a few years ago, which is designed to dissolve the clot, is only administered to about 5% of the patients that have an ischemic stroke every year because 95% of the patients can't get to the doctor in time. So the best that we can actually offer these individuals is palliative care, physical therapy, rehabilitation, trying to keep them in a safe, uh, clean, stable environment. Now, the other forms of neurological disease are just as bad and have also have a substantial uh, economic impact due to a lack of effective therapies. So the economic and social impact of Parkinson's disease is profound, and it's expected to grow even worse in the years ahead. Now at Athersis, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing at the company, um, I'd just like to point out while I'm talking about Parkinson's, we are conducting work that's funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation to explore how the, the, the stem cell therapy that we are working with, multi-stem, might have an impact on more effectively treating Parkinson's disease. We also have a portfolio of other programs in the neurological area, including stroke and multiple sclerosis, 
uh, spinal cord injury and others. And we are not alone. In fact, I'll show you some of the other uh, many organizations that are focused on trying to treat some of the most difficult, challenging, clinical challenges, uh, obstacles that we face in our healthcare system. Now, Alzheimer's disease is another chronic progressive uh, neurological condition uh, that uh, with an enormous impact on both the quality of life and economically. Again, conventional treatment approaches have simply been unable to deal with this problem. Uh, now, it's too soon to say whether cell therapy can actually provide an effective form of treatment for a, a condition like Alzheimer's disease, but there are many other neurological conditions that have an enormous impact on the lives of patients, their families, and the healthcare system where regenerative medicine and cell therapy might provide meaningful help. And if we can make a difference in any of these areas, uh, I think the effects are going to be very far-reaching. Now, in the past couple of days, we've heard some and seen some promising examples about how cell therapy may have an impact, uh, but clearly there's substantial additional work that needs to be done. Now, there are many other areas where significant clinical advances are needed. Uh, as we age, we're far more susceptible to uh, things like renal disease, chronic joint pain, inhibition, or loss of function. In fact, by the time we reach 65, approximately half of us will experience frequent or chronic joint pain. But it isn't just joint pain. It's the loss of structure and function associated with aging and the onset of conditions such as rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. The effort to deal with these clinical challenges has led to an increasing, joint, uh, increasing number of joint replacement surgeries, uh, which have helped many individuals. But these procedures typically entail extensive physical therapy and rehab. Um, obviously, they're quite invasive. Imagine what it would be like if we could prevent or slow the degradation using minimally invasive and more effective biological therapies that actually achieve effective tissue regeneration and repair. We could have a dramatic impact on the quality of life for many patients that otherwise watch their quality of life literally erode away. Now, I believe that the United States is fundamentally deeply compassionate and caring nation. And I also believe that this perspective is shared by many people irrespective of their political ideology. Uh, we want to help each other. But unfortunately, from a national economic perspective, we simply can't afford to pay for all the promises we've chosen to make to ourselves as a nation. Limited resources and dramatically expanding need inevitably lead to one outcome, rationing. In fact, it's interesting, yesterday there was an article on the front page of USA Today, and it proposed several potential things that we can do to help the Medicare system in the coming years. And several of those are either direct or indirect forms of rationing. And people don't talk about it like that, but that's the reality of the situation that we're facing. So rationing is not where we want to be, because who wants access to less health care? Uh, cost controls are not the answer, because all that will simply do will stifle innovation. It will impede investment in the development of what I believe is the real solution, which is the development of innovative technologies that can help us deliver better, safer, and more effective therapies to deal with the fundamental challenges that we face. So if this sounds like a scary scenario ahead, uh, trust me, I, I believe that it is. But thankfully, um, there's an alternative. We can invest in technological innovation. And if we do it intelligently and if we execute well, we can achieve the transformational impact that we all want and, in fact, desperately need. Now, we need this investment to focus on the achievement of three fundamental goals. First, we need to focus on the development of therapies that significantly improve clinical outcomes in areas of substantial unmet medical need especially where the cost burden and quality of life impact is extraordinarily high. Success in these areas will drive opportunities for success in other areas. Second, uh, we need to examine how we can apply these therapies to both enhance patient quality of life and alleviate the burden on caregivers, including clinicians, nurses, and family members, so that we can more effectively leverage our available human resources. We can't just shift the burden of care away from the the clinicians and, uh, and nurses to the family members. And finally, we need to quantitatively evaluate how we can improve costs. So Chris said something very important in his presentation, which is we can develop these safer, more effective therapies, but unless they're cost effective at the end of the day, then we may very well win the battle but lose the war. So we have to focus on pharmacoeconomic effectiveness. We really need to, to study how we can shift the cost curve in the right direction. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this a little later. This will require a new way of thinking. Historically, most companies in our industry have been extremely resistant to the concept in terms of thinking of cost effectiveness. But that needs to change. 
But to be clear, in most instances, I would argue that we need to avoid the concept of comparative effectiveness because this can be a highly flawed concept. In its simplest form, it assumes that each patient will respond to each therapy equivalently. We know that's not the case, both in terms of efficacy and side effects. And what works best on average should work best for all. But this simply isn't true. So pharmacoeconomic effectiveness is fundamentally distinct from comparative effectiveness. And we need to think about those two, uh, those new paradigms differently. Now, over the past few years, we've seen the emergence and advancement of multiple approaches to regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy. And I'm going to give you some benchmarks a little bit later that actually illustrate some of the steady progress we've been making. And we've also seen a steady advancement of programs into clinical development. But so much more needs to be done. Now, it's too soon to say which of these approaches will have the greatest clinical impact. I personally believe, as Chris and many others do, that multiple approaches will succeed. So at Athersis, we are developing an allogeneic, off-the-shelf, if you will, cell therapy uh, product that we believe can deliver meaningful impact in multiple different areas of great clinical need. But I also believe that the autologous approaches and the tissue engineering approaches and other forms of cell therapy and regenerative medicine are equally valid and have tremendous potential in their own rights. So I believe what's going to happen over the next few years, and hopefully over the next several years, is that we are going to provide compelling evidence that these therapies can literally reshape the clinical landscape as we know it. And we have to do that in a very systematic, uh, uh, methodical way, through properly designed and executed, rigorously controlled, adequately powered clinical studies. Now, I could tell stories about each one of the organizations that are represented on this slide and the exciting work they're doing. Um, Aldogen, for example, that recently, they're using autologous cell therapy. They recently launched a phase two clinical trial to treat stroke patients. Their first patients were enrolled right here in Southern California. And it got a fair amount of immediate attention, which I think is great. Um, I could talk about many of the other companies that have, done, that have done work in treating cardiovascular disease or treating other neurological conditions. Or, uh, or that are trying to come up with innovative solutions for renal disease or a range of other things. And, and believe me, I'd love to talk about each one of these, uh, these companies at great length. And I invite you to visit their websites, look at what they're doing, go to the website for the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine to really find out about some of the exciting progress. And of course, I couldn't fit all the logos on one slide. I could show you a series of slides, but I figured uh, better to just describe it kind of qualitatively. There's some really exciting progress that's being made here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for the next couple of minutes about um, what we're doing in Athersis. Okay. Uh, now, in Athersis, we're developing a, a therapeutic product called Multistem, which is, it, it um, utilizes a specific early progenitor class of stem cells, multipotent adult progenitor cells, that we can get right out of bone marrow or other tissue and organ systems from healthy, young, consenting donors. And this product, as we're developing it, as Chris described, we're trying to make this as easy and practical to utilize as possible. So we're literally trying to develop it as an off-the-shelf therapy that can be administered by the clinician with minimal to no processing, delivered directly at the point of care, so it can be fast, convenient, and hopefully very effective, efficient therapy. Now I'd like to tell you about just some of the characteristics of Multistem. Um, this is a product that we've demonstrated we can actually manufacture on an industrial scale. So because of the unique properties of the cells that we work with, we can take these cells and we can grow them up in very substantial quantities. In fact, um, we can actually take cells from one healthy consenting donor and we can expand the cells because of their unique growth properties to produce the equivalent of millions of clinical doses of material. We, we believe that that is a very significant uh, step forward or advantage uh, in terms of the ability to address the manufacturing issues that Chris talked about. We can also freeze the product and store it for an extended period of time. In fact, um, through the studies that we designed and have been executing under the supervision or, or under the auspices of, uh, that we designed to, to address uh, the requirements of the FDA, we've shown that we can actually freeze the product stably for more than four years. We're in the process of completing a five-year stability study. So imagine if you could actually manufacture a lot of stem cells, you could freeze them for a long period of time, you could put them in a cryo bag or a vial such that you could actually very efficiently deliver it at the point of care when it's needed by the patient and by the clinician. Um, the other thing about this is that we've demonstrated through the clinical work, we have four clinical studies that are ongoing right now, um, three that are in phase two clinical development, um, and, and one that's uh, just a, a phase one study that we're completing. And we've shown so far, based on the work that we've done, a very consistent safety profile. And we've also seen through 
years of preclinical work that we've conducted with a broad international network of collaborators that these cells, like other cell types, can actually exert their healing effects through multiple distinct mechanisms. So they can express multiple factors that, that uh, have some very profound effects. But interestingly, these are not a transplant. So Chris drew the distinction between cells that are transplants and cells that are more, have a more biologic profile. And our cells are not permanent transplants. Now this just shows you, this kind of a graphical summary, if you will, of some of the mechanisms that we know that these cells can act through. We know that they can dramatically reduce you know, inflammation. They can restore a durable balance to immune system function. We know that they can protect, uh, protect at-risk tissue in regions of tissue damage or injury, so following a heart attack or following a stroke or uh, other types of injury or damage. We know that these cells can express proangiogenic and vasculogenic factors when they are uh, in an environment of ischemic injury, for example, so help new blood vessels to form. Um, and again, they can exert their effects to help regenerate and repair tissue through indirect effects, not simply by going in and replacing what's been damaged or what's been lost. So it's this multimodal effects of cells. Uh, and that doesn't just relate to what we're working with. It relates to other forms of cell therapy as well that are very exciting because that is something you simply cannot do with a traditional pharmaceutical or a biologic. Now, let's take a look at some of the specific areas where I think these technologies are going to have um, a tremendous impact. In the cardiovascular area, th the good news is that there are many more patients now that are surviving that initial heart attack thanks to the advent of balloon angioplasty, stenting, other forms of intervention. The bad news is, is that many patients that are surviving that initial heart attack are now progressing to congestive heart failure within the next few years. And that is actually a more expensive uh, and a severely debilitating thing to deal with. So if we can treat the damage from the heart attack more effectively, help the patient recover more efficiently, we can reduce the risk of progression to congestive heart failure. And because once a patient has actually advanced to the, to the point where they're experiencing congestive heart failure, I can tell you there is no good ending to that story. And traditional medicine just simply has not developed a solution to deal with it. So it's the multimodal biological mechanisms of action in cardiovascular disease that I think where we can really have a great impact in terms of improving near-term outcomes, but also the long-term prospects for patients that are suffering from various forms of cardiovascular disease. And there's been a number of very exciting clinical studies, which again, some of them are early, that show that intervention of cell therapy for advanced forms of vascular disease uh, can, can have a profound impact in terms of improving, uh, promoting formation of new blood vessels and actually improving patient quality of life. So I think that this can have a very significant clinical and economic impact. Now at Athersis, I'll just talk, talk to you briefly about what we're doing. Um, we are administering multi-stem to heart attack patients. We, we completed a, uh, an early clinical study. It was a phase one clinical trial that involved about 25 patients that we just announced results on in the past few months. And we administered this shortly after patients suffered a heart attack by directly uh, injecting multi-stem into the heart through a very rapid procedure using a proprietary delivery system that we licensed rights to um, that's shown here. So what this slide shows you is this is what happens normally. You've got an obstruction that actually includes blood flow. The patient will undergo balloon angioplasty, um, and then a stent will be inserted. We've added a third step to that process, if you will, which is the injection, if you will, of multi-stem directly into the region of ischemic injury and damage. Now, as you can see here from this bottom panel, this, this is actual images from the first patient that was treated at the Cleveland Clinic. So we conducted this clinical study at the Cleveland Clinic, um, at Henry Ford, other leading cardiovascular centers. And, and what you see here is, is that this process is very rapid. It takes about a minute, we administer the cells, then the patient's done, they can go back to their recovery room. Now what we saw from following these patients out and, and measuring them at one month and four months and one year, is that by the end of the one year time frame, we had seen some very substantial, so we saw a very consistent safety profile, but we also saw evidence of substantial improvements in cardiovascular function among patients that had severely compromised cardiovascular function as a result of the heart attack. And when we looked at this, this data even further, we could see that there was a clear divergence. So what we're comparing here is patients that are starting at about the same point, patients that received multi-stem showed enhanced and accelerated improvement relative to the current standard of care. And we saw a consistent pattern actually um, when we looked at various different cardiovascular functional metrics. So we're seeing evidence, although it's a small study, 
and it's still very early in the clinical development process, but we and others are seeing very encouraging signs that we can actually have a meaningful impact on improving outcomes for these types of patients. Now what we need to do is actually test that on a larger scale through a, and in fact that's exactly what we're in the process of doing. A little bit later this year, in the next several months, we'll launch a phase two study which will involve about 150 patients. Uh, it'll be a double blind, uh, properly controlled study. What we'll actually be seeing if, this, if these trends and these indicators actually hold up uh, in a larger number of patients. I think that the, the impact on an area like stroke can also be profound. So earlier I talked about the exciting work that Aldogen is doing. We also have a clinical program in stroke. In fact, we are just now in the process of launching a phase two trial where we will be administering multi-stem to about, 100, about 140 patients all told in the trial. It'll be a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And again, the exciting thing is, is that the multiple ways that cell therapy can actually have an impact on reducing the inflammatory damage, actually protecting and preserving at-risk tissue in the brain, and exerting effects through multiple different pathways. The really exciting effects from a healthcare perspective relate to reduced hospitalization, long-term inst institutional care costs, and giving patients back the quality of life they so desperately want. Better clinical outcomes will lead to reduced disability rates, uh, reduced physical therapy, rehab, long-term institutional care costs, and that's where I think we're going to have a tremendous impact. Um, this just shows some data that we published uh, a while ago that actually shows that the time frame of being able to deliver a therapy like multi-stem is where I think it's going to have uh, a significant impact. So it's not just the multiple ways that we can actually affect or enhance healing, but it's doing it in a practical time frame. So we published data that shows that we can administer multi-stem a day, two days, even a week after a stroke has occurred, and see virtually complete recovery in the preclinical models where we did work. If we can see anything like that in clinical trials, and obviously we have a lot of work to do to show that, it's going to be very, very exciting. Similarly, Aldogen is administering their therapy um, about two to three weeks after the stroke has occurred. So if you can see any kind of meaningful impact in those types of clinical situations, and there are other companies uh, that are working on similar types of approaches, and if any of those are successful, it's going to reshape the clinical landscape in stroke. Um, we're working in other areas. We have a partnership with Pfizer that we announced a couple of years ago to focus on chronic inflammatory disease, specifically inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the current forms of therapy to treat inflammatory bowel disease are limited. In fact, many patients don't re respond to them or they only respond very transiently. If we can actually develop through the application of a, a product like Multistem, more effective, more durable ways to restore immunological balance or homeostasis, it could have a profound benefit for these types of patients. Now I want to spend a few minutes um, just talking briefly about some of the progress that we're seeing. One of the things that we've started to do with the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine is to track the activity in terms of clinical trial activity. If you go on to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the repository, if you will, for information, high-level information related to clinical studies, um, you will find that if you do a search on, on stem cell clinical trials, you're going to find a lot, of, a lot of hits. You're going to find a lot of uh, clinical trials that involve stem cells in one way, shape, or form. But a lot of these trials r relate to the use of traditional hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for oncology settings. So we wanted to take a look at what happens if we, if we eliminate that activity and we just focus on some of, the, some of the other forms of cell therapy and regenerative medicine. And what, what kind of progress have we been making over the past few years? And what we see is, is that there has been a steady growth, both in terms of the number of trials that are being conducted, um, as well as the number of patients that are impacted in those trials. So this actually presents some of this data in a slightly different way. So this is trials initiated, active trials, just within the past few years. And again, this is a very narrow definition of, uh, of cell therapy. But what it shows us is, is there's been a steady increase in terms of the number of trials that are being initiated and run. And what we're also seeing is more advancement in the mid and later stage clinical trials. And obviously some of this is impacted by the state of the financing environment, which uh, affects the companies that are trying to do this work. But there is some good indicators of progress that are being made. So this just shows uh, increased activity by, uh, by trial sponsors and the type of sponsors. And so what we see is it's not just commercial sponsors where we're seeing good steady growth, but we're also seeing it at some of the leading stem cell academic centers and clinical centers. So we're seeing good steady progress on multiple different fronts. We're also seeing that it's affecting a greater number of patients over time. So as, the, as things progress deeper into clinical development, more and more patients are actually being enrolled into these studies. Uh, we, which, again, I, I think is an indicator of, of progress. Obviously, 2008 was a very unusual year for the entire industry. 
um, hopefully one that uh, will not be replicated in full fashion uh, ever. Um, but I think that the point is, is that we are fundamentally subject to the whims of the capital markets. It doesn't make any sense to me, to be perfectly honest, why so many of the stem cell and regenerative medicine companies, the public ones in particular, should be, be adversely impacted by what's going on in Greece. I mean, we've seen companies just over the past few months in the summer lose tremendous amounts of value. Um, nothing has fundamentally changed with these companies. Their clinical programs are still advancing. Their technology is still valid and very promising. They can still have a transformational impact in many different areas of medicine, but the reality of it is, is that the capital markets behave the way they do. We can't control that. It's disappointing and frustrating, but it is what it is. Uh, we're also seeing that there are certain pockets of activity where a lot of this clinical trial activity is being focused in precisely the areas that we would expect, things like cardiovascular disease, neurological disorders, uh, inflammatory disease, um, other forms of, of tremendous unmet medical need. Now, interestingly, we're, we're seeing growth in particular types of uh, clinical trials with respect to particular cell types. Um, for example, there's a lot of activity around uh, mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal-like stem cells, marostromal cells, if you will. And so we're seeing a lot of increased activity around those particular cell, cell types. Time will tell which of the, the cell therapy approaches that are being utilized is going to be the most successful. The good news is, is that we're seeing good, steady progress on multiple different fronts. Okay. There's also been an enormous growth in the number of publications that are, that are being uh, published every year. Um, I mean, literally, there are thousands and thousands of publications related to exciting progress that relates to whether it's embryonic stem cells or uh, neural uh, progenitor cells or mesenchymal stem cells or others. And again, I think that's a good indicator because we're learning a lot more about the science and the underlying biology. That is critical to achieving that long-term goal, which is really understanding how these therapies can be effectively applied. Now, I, I think that just in, in summing how I think regenerative medicine is going to change healthcare, it really comes down to three specific things. I think it's focusing our efforts on areas of substantial unmet need where conventional treatment approaches have utterly failed. And I think that the impact can be felt across all major disease areas. And I've tried to just give you a couple of select examples today. I think that multiple approaches are going to work, as Chris talked about earlier. I think a lot of emphasis has to be placed on reducing the institutional care burden, uh, significantly enhancing patient quality of life. But I also think we have to focus on substantially reducing health care costs. That's a critical part of the equation. Uh, reducing hospitalization, reducing long-term institutional care costs, reducing home care costs. That will be how we have uh, one of the greatest impacts in terms of transforming health care as we know it. Now, there are a few obstacles that we need to worry about. Obstacles on the regulatory front, the financial front, the clinical validation front. One of the things, one of the mistakes that I've seen a lot of groups make is running small, inadequately powered, frankly, not rigorously constructed clinical trials. We can't keep doing that. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, we also have to make sure that we're interacting with the FDA in a clear, effective manner so that we can work with them, not in an adversarial way, because they want the same things that we want. They want to see safe, effective medicines developed at the end of the day, and that's one of the very important things that the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine is doing. Um, we also have to work on the acceptance factors. Now, this doesn't just mean uh, physician acceptance, it means patient acceptance. Patients are becoming increasingly sophisticated in the age of the Internet. They can do their homework. They can go online. They can look at um, the profile for the technologies of the medicines, and they can actually learn about these things, maybe not develop perfect understanding, but certainly get a lot of information. We also have to educate third-party payers. At the end of the day, we can develop therapies, as Chris was talking about earlier, but if we don't have the right dynamic in place, Again, it may not achieve ultimately the clinical or the economic impact that we want to have at the end of the day. And this, again, leads me back to the, the need to actually evaluate in a rigorous and quantitative way pharmacoeconomic benefit. Now, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine was established a couple of years ago to take on some of these challenges, to be a voice for policymakers and other, uh, other parts uh, of the regulatory environment and, and uh, you know, key parts of the industry so that we could actually help educate them, interact with them, work with them, so that we could create a clearer, more efficient path so that we can hopefully accelerate and, and begin to eliminate some of the impediments that are really holding back the development of stem cells and regenerative medicine. Um, and I think in, in the two years that we've actually been working on this, we've seen some exciting progress on a number of different fronts. 
And I invite you to go to the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine website to, uh, to take a look at some of the things that we've been doing. I think one of the things we have to do is we have to explain more clearly just exactly how we can have an impact in these each, each of these disease areas and how we can help improve the cost effectiveness of health care. And we also have to educate the public uh, in a more effective way. So I think that there's a number of barriers that we're going to break down. Uh, we're actively working on this. There are some very specific things that I think we can get done. Uh, I think creating regional and ultimately a national and, and even international clinical trial network would be one great way to enable faster, more efficient advancement of programs into clinical development. I know Andy Grove talked yesterday about the, the frustration and the obstacles that relate to translational medicine. Um, I think there are some specific things that we can do to overcome some of these uh, frustrating barriers and obstacles that have been in our way. I think we need to put more effort on developing more effective preclinical models. A lot of the preclinical models that exist today that we have to rely on are frankly not good measures of biological activity for new therapies. So we've got to work with the NIH and other uh, scientific leaders around the world to actually develop better, more effective models and then make those models accessible to everybody that, that really needs to get access to them. I think we've got to hold ourselves to a higher standard, as I mentioned, about clinical trial design. Um, I think we need to safeguard against particular types of activities that are very d dangerous and risky activities. So medical tourism, and I'm, I think there are good forms of medical tourism, and I think there are bad forms of medical tourism. And I think uh, therapy in an unregulated, unsanctioned environment is a very dangerous thing. Yes, you want to be able to offer up hope to patients, but I think if you're not doing it in a, in a very careful, um, rigorously done way, you're simply putting people at risk or you're offering them false hope. Again, integrating pharmacoeconomic analysis into our development approaches is critical. And I think working together, um, whether it's under the auspices of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine or through other forms, will help us have the kind of impact that we can ultimately have. So with that, I'd like to close. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. I'm not sure if can't take any questions. Yeah. But uh, in any event, I'll be around for a few minutes uh, after the talk, happy to answer any questions. I believe that regenerative medicine is on the cusp of really transforming medicine as we know it. And I think we're going to start to see the evidence of that within the next couple of years as more and more clinical data begins to emerge. We're not going to be able to fix everything. Nobody's even, nobody should be pretending that we, that we can do that. And in, in many areas, we may, may not be able to approach curing various diseases, but I think what we can do is fundamentally improve the level and the quality of clinical care that is conveyed. And I think if we can do that in a few of these high impact areas that I mentioned, it really will have a transformational impact. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention.